So thank you very much for all uh, listening this afternoon to the talk about a really fascinating project that I was very fortunate to work on with my colleague uh, Gaynor Weston. So it's entitled Manufactured Bodies, the Impact of Industrialization on London Health. And it really stemmed from an earlier project that uh, Gaynor and I had worked on previously. And Gaynor had the super idea for expanding it to look at the bigger picture of the impact of industrialization because we were able to have greater numbers of skeletal collections that we would now have access to. We were incredibly fortunate uh, to be awarded the Rosemary Green Grant through the uh, City of London Archaeological Trust. And this was really fantastic because it enabled us to be able to carry out a project because it's very important to be able to have large skeletal samples and data sets. And also it was possible with the advent of access to osteoarchaeology for digital radiography to be able to actually implement that and apply that to the skeletal 3D modeling and to ultimately bring with it really a synthesis of the osteological data, clinical data, modern records and documentary sources that could then put everything into context. So really to contextualize it. So it was a fabulous opportunity uh, to be able to carry out a project and, and undertake a question of this scale. Starting really with the Museum of London was key uh, because the museum is very fortunate to be able to create and look after over 20,000 skeletal remains that have been excavated, 2,000 years history of London and are really a unique representation of the people themselves and how they're sharing their life history and their life course through their, their bones to tell us about the life uh, that they have led. What's also key is that we have the contextual information with them and this really helps enormously because that allows us then to have information with regard to how they're buried, burial type artifacts that may have been with them and the dating process, which obviously is very key and significant for us to be able to know the time period that they're from. With the osteological data, what has been really marvelous over the last few years is that we have standard methods now for recording. And again, this is really key so that you have confidence when you're going to your data sources that we're all then recording in a similar standard. And for us, we had the database and this is a brilliant research tool because it holds large amounts of data and it enabled us to actually search those data sets. And because of the large number of the skeletal collections, we could also then have a very large sample to go to collect our sample sizes for our study. So the museum was a, a brilliant repository to be able to start from. So industrialization is really very pivotal uh, within history and key to London's rapid expansion. And for many, it really is seen as being like a trigger to the modern way in which we live and what we know as the uh, industrial period. So the area that we were looking at in the time period was covering really from 1750 to 1900. And this particular time is dominated particularly in terms of seeing changes within manufacturing processes, mechanization, increases in population sizes. The, the population of London had, had always been very large, but it was forever um, expanding and getting much bigger and putting more pressures upon the society with it. By the 1700s, it was in fact, not only the largest city in Europe, but you also have half of England's urban population actually living within London itself. And what was very noticeable as well is that we have these very marked um, social divisions, which then equally have a great impact upon it. So it's a, a really enormous metropolitan um, urban metropolis, and also is one of the, the largest ports and you've got lots of trading. So everything really is big on a large scale. 
for the project itself, we wanted to have a geographical distribution because we wanted to be able to have a comparison. So when we were talking and looking at London, we had others. And so that was really uh, key for having that ability to be able to compare and contrast. We also, for trying to see changes, wanted to have groups that would be seen to be pre-industrial and industrial so that again you're able to pick up any patterns and trends. We were trying for a target of 2,500 individuals which was a large sample number to try to achieve and we did rather well we got 2,241 because it can be quite difficult sometimes accessing uh, sites and collections with large numbers. Within our project, we were only looking at adults and we only were including adults where it was possible to have an age and sex estimate. And we had this so that we were then able to have cohorts of individuals grouped as being young, middle and old. And when we're thinking about archaeological material, it isn't always complete. And so this was something else that we had to factor in. And for us, we were looking for individuals that are at least 70% uh, complete or more and had a moderate to good preservation so that, again, we're not then being affected too much by factors of post-mortem uh, damage or interventions. And this was used also in terms of our crude prevalence rate. For the true prevalence rate, we had a skeletal inventory and that had a particular criteria of the completeness of individual elements that would then be uh, used in working out the different uh, rates in terms of the, the diseases that we would be looking at. So we were looking then at a combination of data sets. We were using our archaeological data, our osteological data. We were bringing in historical records. So we have census records, uh, bills of mortality. We're using environmental data from uh, present day and modern clinical references. So again, to, to bring in that richness of, of contextualization to the whole study for then looking to answer the, the questions. Just to show the variety of locations that were outside of London. And that was key. So we really did need to have that comparator for all different types of uh, sites, all different types of locations. And they could be rural, they could be small towns, they could be sort of close to the edge of cities. But it was so that we were getting a really good sweep and range of all of the different sites. So we might have uh, something like Fuston, which is quite a small village, but had a big mill associated with it. We have Barton on Humber, that was important for uh, trading. And then we have somewhere like Warren Percy, where we have things that wax and wane. They maybe get smaller, they get bigger, and there's lots of things that are actually changing within the makeup of them. So it was really key that we had that variety. And so these sites outside of London, they were diverse and they were distinct from London. So we have that lovely contrast. For London, uh, with this map, you can see the, the sites that we were looking at. Again, we had a, a really good range and a nice spread uh, across London, different locations. And also what was interesting with our London sites is that it was really possible within those to see a structure of status. So we were able to see that social status. But equally with some of the London sites, some of those could be classed almost as being sort of rural or villages. So as you're sort of coming out more of what might be deemed as the city itself. So somewhere like Chelsea is rather green and lovely and associated with market gardens. And so you do have this really nice rich variety. So again, it was all for comparison and contrast. And then also key when we're looking at those um, social structure changes. And something like that was very evident when looking at the documentary sources. So here with the Booth poverty maps, we've got two contrasts. On the one side, you can see Victoria Park, Mile End and Bethnal Green. And we actually had a, a large collection from a burial ground in Bethnal Green. And you can see with the color coding, 
how it highlights that difference. So where you have on the one side, you've got the, the much darker sort of black and blue, where it's classing them as lower class, vicious, semi-criminal, very poor, casual and chronic want, to the other side where we have the district of Chelsea, which has much more of the yellow and the red and the pink, where you're an upper middle class to wealthy. And we also had a, a group of individuals that had been buried at Chelsea Old Church. So this was really brilliant as well because we had this documentary evidence, but we also then had individuals that were buried in, in these areas for reflecting these differences. So the chart here shows us the skeletal demographic profile from our actual skeletal study and how then the individuals are grouped. So for our young adults, we have 18 to 34 years of age and an old adult was 50 years and over. And so sad to have these um, ranges uh, because again, we're using data from different sources. And so this then enables us to group them collectively into our cohorts for the young, middle and um, old age. So our areas of research, we covered five themes and we wanted in the synthesis of the oscillological data to actually then make it so that it was pertinent to topics and issues that are relevant today. And the areas that we covered in relation to that were trauma and hazardous environments, which may be in relation to where you're working or living, pollution, cancer, obesity, and aging. And with that, it was bringing in and drawing in all of these different data sets. So the osteological uh, research that had been done, the digital radiographic um, archive that was generated, the CT scanning, the records, Again, all of that lovely contextual information. And all of that was then linking in so that we could then compare and contrast what we might be seeing in terms of the health of Londoners across pre-industrial to industrial time period. And with that, it gave us a much better sense and understanding of the relevance that the role of your living, so where people were living, whether that be in a location within London or further afield outside of London, and then within your local uh, settings. And so really then the key question is, well, how does living in London affect the lives in the past and how has that continued to do so uh, today? In looking at that, we decided to look um, at seven uh, diseases. So the concept of that research, we looked at these because they seem to be linked more in association with things like industrialization, an enriched lifestyle, urbanization, and um, old age. And so the ones that we looked at were hyperostosis frontalis in Turner, which thankfully can be shortened to HFI, osteoporosis, joint disease, trauma, neoplastic disease, lung inflammation, which could be for us looking at rib lesions and maybe linked to smoking, and diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, which is shortened to DISH. And you can see from uh, the images, these are some of the things that we might see macroscopically. So these bones are showing us changes that we can see with our naked eye, but by using our radiography, we were also then able to look inside them. So we have that combination um, of the two. And then you can see there, we've got a rather splendid gentleman um, with his pipe. So when we were carrying out the, the project and thinking about the radiography, nothing in terms of radiography had been done on this scale. So it was a really large undertaking but we had to then think about uh, constraints of time, what's going to be possible in the time and where you might be uh, located. And so it was to target uh, key areas of the skeleton that would then be representative of uh, different types of diseases that we might see throughout the, the skeleton. So we then decided to radiograph the crania, the lumbar vertebra, the left femur, 
the left and right pelvis and the left and right second metacarpal. And by having that suite of elements, even if not every single individual that we were able to find had all of those elements, there was the chance that we were then going to be able to pick up the different disease patterns within the elements that uh, were present. So what was really fabulous was having a portable digital radiographic kit. This was really brilliant because in the past, trying to carry out radiography was either trying to use wet film and maybe a machine that looks a bit like a microwave oven and you can't get a femur in it, or having to travel around with boxes of skeletons to a hospital and use a kit there. This kit being portable meant that we could take it to the skeletal collections and we set up in the rotunda. So the picture you can see there of that rather lovely concrete wall is the rotunda. And we spent many days, uh, generally always cold, carrying out the radiography. And it was to use direct digital radiography. So when it was taking an image, that image was directly being fed straight into the computer. And we followed clinical standards, and these are known as DICOM, Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine, because they're mechanisms that have been used globally. They can store, you can exchange images, you can transmit them, and it's used in the clinical uh, field. And the operator of the kit was a radiographer, and this also was very important so that we again were following uh, good standards and good protocol. The image of the cranium you can see is on a left lateral position. And again, we followed that we would always take the elements in the same position. So we had that consistency and continuity. And when we then came to look and evaluate the x-rays and interpret them, we were also fortunate to have the assistance of a retired radiologist who fortunately had come to volunteer at the Museum of London. So we now have an archive of over 16,000 digital radiographic images, which has been phenomenal for the project and then hopefully also can help other researchers in the future. So one of the um, areas that we were looking at was the occupational hazards that may be encountered. So it always is increasing and in a period of 100 years it increased by uh, three and a half million and continues to rise uh, today. We're aware of different risks that um, have been faced in the past. So when we're looking at rural areas, we can see that there's a high risk from um, agricultural and ag agrarian roles that people would be carrying out. But then when we begin to go into the more mechanized uh, periods of time with machinery, then there's a really marked increase in the hazards that the people working on such equipments um, were faced with. And also some of the really nasty toxic environments in which they then may have been. So they may have been really close quarter working, very cramped, nasty conditions and dust particles as well. It seemed that it was often more um, male dominated in terms of working with uh, the machinery, having that skilled labor and with heavy industry and construction. So very sort of hard physical work. Um, low status females were still uh, working in those sort of environments and in that industry and, and manufacturing, but they also could be found then doing piecework from home. If you were in a middle class um, situation, you might not then be involved in that physical side so much, but then maybe doing um, more roles in relation to things like the retail or bookkeeping. And within industrial London, you do tend to see this um, distinct uh, setup of uh, roles that are coming into the workplace. And uh, unfortunately, retirement was rare and as we go forward, people might feel that retirement is, is getting rarer as well. So when we were looking at actual bones um, that were then damaged, so we're looking at fractures, we then looked at the uh, selected bones from all of the different time periods within the groups. And that was so that we could then assess to see if there were any changes in the fracture patterns over time, 
could it be that maybe we can see and uh, work it in terms of relation to a work role or occupation and bearing in mind also things like sports. Uh, sports in the past could be really rather violent, um, didn't really have uh, any uh, regulations that, um, that we have now, and something like mob football was really very violent and people could get very seriously hurt, and there, there could even be deaths. So people didn't seem surprised if they were involved in something like that that may then cause their demise. And also there are coroner's records, and uh, some of those can be really rather uh, harrowing and distressing and, and sad when you read about some of the uh, accidents and, and incidents that have happened to people in the past. Um, but one that really stood out that, that Gaynor found, well, unfortunately, was somebody that is recorded as death by cheese and can't say that it's because they ate the cheese. Unfortunately, they were on a cart and those really very large cheeses rolled off and they were killed, unfortunately, in that manner. So when we're thinking about the, the types of fractures and trauma in the skeleton, usually they're caused mainly because of uh, falling or having a blow. Elderly do tend to be more vulnerable. This could be linked because then they are older and potentially more uh, fragile, but also that as you've got older, it's maybe more likely that you could then accumulate um, more fractures. So when looking at the actual groups and uh, samples of individuals, it was to combine the young and middle age groups and then look at the old age groups. And it was to enable the assessment to be done in terms of relating biologically to age and sex. And what was uh, also important was when we were looking into the London population, was that we could also then examine the fracture pattern in relation to the uh, social status. And when we were using clinical data, that then enabled us to infer about the nature of the fracture uh, causation in the past. So again, it was bringing in all these rich uh, different data sources that we had available to us. So when we actually looked at the uh, patterns that were, that were revealed, the most common anatomical area that was affected was the ribs. And then the next was the hand or lower arm. And for London, uh, the fractures did seem to be very much in specific areas in, in the ribs and hands. And that may then relate to the roles that males possibly had been doing during the um, industrial period. So it might then link into to the actual sort of occupations and hazards that they faced. The least affected bones um, in the majority of the groups appeared to be the humerus and the femur. And we found a very low level of actual femoral fractures, so thigh bone fractures. And that could then indicate that there was sort of less high impact accidents uh, during that uh, time period in the past and even during the industrial period. And potentially maybe what's key with something like that is that it's actually maybe more related to the speed and high velocity impact injuries that we might see something like the um, femoral fractures. And with cranial um, injuries, we did see them and we would see them either as a blunt force or sharp force, but they were relatively low in comparison to patterns that we would see uh, today, which are usually um, a higher rate. So this 3D model image is of a crania of an individual and you can see the arrow pointing there to the aperture. And that is a sharp force trauma and it's, it's got rounded edges. And so this person actually survived uh, that really very nasty um, injury. But when we're thinking again, in terms of injuries like this with sharp uh, force trauma, we're also then thinking about things like interpersonal um, violence, the type of violence that, that we may have seen. There are records of um, violent murders in London, but we may not always see those reflected in our skeletal evidence within our uh, cranial injuries. So we have to just be aware sometimes that we may have some limitations um, in what we're seeing. But for sharp force trauma generally, we had similar rates over all periods and, and all locations.
so ultimately, when we looked at it collectively, uh, the industrialization of London really did have this significant increase in fractures. And really what was key was social status and that for low status males and females in London, they had a much greater risk of experiencing trauma by the time they'd reached an old age. Higher status in the industrial period appeared to be a buffer effect and there seemed to be a reduced risk of fractures for males and females in London at that time. Interestingly, when we look at the sites outside of London, um, we then see an increase in trauma, but it didn't then seem to be linked necessarily to industrialization. And that may be again, because they were already potentially within doing within the agricultural and agrarian lifestyle um, in which they were living and working. The next um, part that, um, that we looked at, um, oh, just before I go on to that bit, if I can just go back, what I just wanted to say was that um, in one of the documentary sources was that Spitalfields, Bow and North Shields had the three highest rates for violent crime in 1851 to 18 and middle aged adults. So, again, possibly that might be a pattern today in terms of some younger individuals that are more violence and crime. So going back then, just talking now to our next uh, area was about pollution and um, pollution does take on many different forms. There might be a whole variety of different particles that could be within the, the wider environment itself. The environment in, in which we live, so if we're then having burning of coal or wood, which may be indoors in fires or for cooking, and then particularly within pre-industrial London, you have the burning of sea coals, which seem to be particularly noxious and not very pleasant at all. And then lifestyle habits such as smoking, and also thinking about the environment in which people are working. So what type of things they might actually be inhaling from the manufacturing process and where they're working. The conditions again in which they might be. So if it's not very well ventilated, if it's a very small area, you've got dust and you've got very nasty particles. In earlier records, it would seem that uh, London wasn't too bad in the early medieval period, but it does seem that from about the 13th century, there are indications that they were aware that actually the problem with pollution was um, beginning to occur at that point. And then as we go on in towards the 16th and 17th century, we have John Evelyn, who actually writes the fumifugium, or the inconvenience of the air and smoke of London dissipated. And John Gaunt in 1662 in his pamphlet has actually done an analysis of mortality within the city and then has actually said that he's suggesting air pollution from burning of coal is a problem to public health so this overall concern to everybody's um, health generally. We also then see when we have the introduction with tobacco and the manufacturing um, of pipes and uh, James I wasn't very keen on smoking um, at all. And he's noted as saying that it was a custom loathsome to the eye. And he tried to regulate the trade of tobacco and the manufacture of pipes in one area, but it didn't last for very long and was superseded by Charles I. And what's quite staggering is when you look at um, records in relation to the London docks in the 1840s in the one of the warehouses there, the tobacco was covering over five acres, so a huge area. And then again, once we get into mechanization and mass production, you get machines then just churning out lots and lots of cigarettes. And again, then you've got more people having access to it, lower status, it's cheaper. So more people then are potentially carrying out that habit. As we move then on further into the 1950s, we have the great smog, um, in London, which was really awful. People couldn't see really the hand in front of their face. I think they were called sort of pea supers, but really very dangerous uh, to people's health. 
And uh, it's been noted that there were about four to 12,000 deaths as a cause of that. It ultimately led then to the Clean Air Act of 1956, but sadly, we still seem to have pollution problems today and it's still very much um, on the agenda of trying to make our air clean. So one way for us when we're thinking about our skeletal material and how would we look at something like a, a pollutant is looking at ribs. And with these, we looked at the inner surface of the rib. So we looked at the visceral surface of the rib and these are known as VSRL, visceral surface rib lesions. And you can see there on the picture, the slightly darker brown coloring. And that then is, is a response to an irritant and inflammation. So it's causing that change that we can then see on the bone itself. And that surface is, is adhering uh, to the lungs. And that data was collated for all of the uh, different time periods. We were aware though, of course, that there are many other things that might cause rib lesions. And obviously we we're aware at that time, something like tuberculosis is very prevalent, but this was an indicator to tell us that something then is causing that irritant. And then we can look into that in relation to uh, pollutants. So on this graph, you can really see that the London industrial population was really struggling um, with pollution. It wasn't very good at all. And they had very high rates of these uh, rib lesions. And actually, you can sort of see that there's an incredibly stark trend for London, where if you're looking at pre-industrial period, it's 2.9% with our rib lesions and going right up to 19.5%. So a really major increase and really putting a lot of strain upon uh, the actual individuals that are then living in an environment like that. Ultimately, when we're then looking at it in terms of with the males or females, it was the young males in lower status who seem to be more affected. And, and that, again, could relate possibly to the roles that they were uh, working in, occupation, and again, the sort of environments that they, they were having to be with. Social status uh, was, was key to this. So if we again think about some of the areas of London, You've got overcrowding, close quarter living, lots of nasty noxious air, both within living and working conditions. So you really are not doing very well if you're in that lower status group. When we looked at uh, smoking, our indicator of smoking are what we would call pipe facets, uh, little sort of notches in, in the dentition. And when we looked at that, we really couldn't see a significant relationship for smoking um, and the presence of rib lesions. And smoking didn't seem to be really a, an important factor as much as the environmental pollution, because that was so poor that actually smoking didn't seem to have much effect upon it. However, today, smoking obviously is much more key and critical to that and does have very marked adverse health effects which can lead to diseases such as uh, cancer. So London, um, unfortunately, is still suffering from poor uh, air quality. It's of great concern. It's very um, uh, noticeable in its connection to cause of mortality and particulate pollution is actually seen to be a greater threat uh, today than smoking. And it's seen to actually have a measured effect in shortening life expectancy. And so as you can see there, it's 1.8 years, so shortening our lives um, by having such poor uh, air quality. And from uh, our analysis, as it says there at the bottom, in relation to the skeletal remains of the Londoners, is that air pollution during the industrial period encompassing atmospheric pollutants, occupational dust and contagious lung diseases posed a dramatically higher risk to health compared to areas outside the city. So London really was being much more uh, affected.
So cancer was another area that we looked at and people today are very much more aware of cancer and for many maybe they think that it's um, a modern uh, disease and unfortunately cancer rates are increasing and it is seen to be an epidemic in modern Britain. The most common cancers that are seen are in the lung and the bowel and the breast and the prostate and they comprise 45% of all cancer deaths. And individuals that are most frequently affected by them are older individuals and usually who are 75 years and older. And uh, it is the second most common cause of death in London. And there's been lots of research carried out in relation to cancer. And it does appear that lifestyle and environment are key factors in the cases of cancer. And quite shockingly there, it's got 90 to 95% um, in relation to that. There are, of course, um, many different factors that might lead to your risk of cancer. There may sadly be genetic predisposition. It may be then a, a job or role that you were involved in. So there are different factors that need to be considered. Detecting cancer in the past can be uh, difficult because of the way they may then have recorded it. So the terminology, the referencing. So for us then to be able to understand that maybe what they're then actually writing, recording um, is cancer. There was an awareness in the past with Greek medicine. There's references by um, Hippocrates to it. And in medieval texts, they talk about uh, changes that are actually visible on the body. So again, they would only be able to actually talk about those changes that, that you'd be able to see with your, your naked eye. There would be very limited um, interventions that they could do, but clearly by having evidence such as this, it isn't a new disease. It is a disease that has been with us, but then there are potentially changes that may then have caused it to um, seemingly increase more greatly now. In the Victorian period, you begin to see more medical interventions and developments of treatments. And in 1851, you see the first uh, cancer hospital to specialize in dealing with cancer, which today is known as the uh, Royal Marsden Hospital. And for us, when we're looking at our skeletal uh, evidence, for us, we're restricted to actually looking at those um, cancers that will affect the bone and that's known as metastatic bone disease because we don't have the soft tissue we're then relying on what we might be seeing changes in the bones themselves and for cancer it was very important as well that we had that radiography ability because we weren't always necessarily going to see changes macroscopically on the outside of the bone there may be changes going on inside that we wouldn't have known about if we hadn't been able to carry out the radiography so having the x-rays was very important by doing the radiography and the ct scanning it meant then we could look actually inside the bone to see any changes and also to be able to distinguish between what might have been post-mortem damage or soiling breast to what actually was a true um, disease change. And we were then screening and looking for metastatic cancers and multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer, whose clinical criteria. So again, able to use clinical protocols. But we also are mindful that cancers may then be developing in the past in potentially different ways. And there would be limited treatment in the past and a poor prognosis. So we may not obviously see a clear representation of all individuals that may have been affected by it. But fortunately today with different modern treatments, they're making huge advances and then prognosis is usually greatly uh, improved. So you can see here from the, the table, um, quite starkly how things have changed over time. Within our project, we only had a small matic and multiple uh, myeloma. But overall, by looking at that, the percentage of the metastatic cases definitely did increase over time. They were in industrial London. And so clearly that must have then be correlating to having a negative effect in terms of that urban environment and urban condition. And with the levels of metastatic cancer and uh, multiple myeloma, 
they are much higher now in modern times than in the past. And you can see this quite clearly in the table where you've got the breakdown of individuals from our groups and then into the, the present day. So another um, part that we were then looking at was uh, into obesity. So they're seeing and larger and obesity is increasing, type two diabetes is on the rise. And with that excess weight, that leads then to this inflammation and a dysregulation of insulin and the changes that they see then in the numbers of people with type two diabetes and hyperinsulinia. Um, so again, it's another area that causes great concern and puts pressure onto the, the health system. For us with the skeletons, of course, we have the bones. So it's quite difficult to then try to work out if somebody may have been overweight or obese. And there were two potential means for detecting that by looking at two diseases. And that was DISH and HFI. And in relation to day, they talk about a thing called metabolic syndrome, where they're looking at co occurring conditions and that might link to things like an excess amount of fat around your waist you've got a high blood sugar rate and that can then link in when they're thinking about stress genetics our more sedentary lifestyle we aren't really as active as we were and greater alcoholic consumption and so it could be then that with us in the past looking at dish and hfi they equally can then feed into this aspect that's known as the metabolic syndrome um, with DISH, you get this proliferation of bone forming within the soft tissue in ligaments and tendons. And you can see in the picture there where we've got the vertebra, the spine, and it really does look like dripping candle wax. So you've got this bone that seems to sort of just drip down from one vertebra to the next. And you become quite stiff. You get the ossification in, in the ligaments. And it does seem to have a predisposition for... Um, for older males. And we see it quite regularly within our skeletal um, assemblages. When we're thinking in terms maybe more with relation to females is the hyperostosis frontalis interna, the HS um, bone growth on the inner surface of the cranium on the frontal bone. And this is where, again, the x-rays were really important to have because the pictures that you can see there, they are damaged crania, so we can see inside them. But if you've got complete crania, you can't see inside, so we wouldn't know if maybe HFI was present or not. So that enabled us to actually look inside and get a much better indication of prevalence rates. And the stages going from A to D can be quite small and proliferative to really large scale um, undulations. And when we were looking at it, the most common occurrence with it was in postmenopausal women. And generally those with a severe type um, do seem to be obese and have a hyperandrogenism, which is the excess of male a hormone. So they do definitely with DISH and HFI seem to link into this um, being overweight and, and, and obese. So on this uh, table here, we can see the comparative rates in relation to DISH and um, HFI. And um, being um, overweight and, and it was certainly influenced by high status um, um, as DISH. And at this time also we're thinking industrial era, we have a really increased sugar consumption, um, very different sort of levels of diet and foodstuffs, particularly with our high status individuals. Uh, it seems the males were always seemingly uh, overindulging themselves, but the females gradually seemingly, as you can see in the chart, were catching up and then seeing those changes with HFI. But from records, there's information in terms of sort of banquets and feasts and lavish food and very rich um, diet. So all adding to the effect of um, making individuals uh, more overweight. In terms of when we're looking at modern population, what was really very interesting is that we had a reverse of the past. 
So in today modern population, those that are most affected seem actually to be suffering from social deprivation. So it's sort of in a complete sort of turnabout. And there really is a marked variation across the locations um, nationally. And interestingly with London, London has very different pattern, it seems, to other areas outside of London. And they have a much lower prevalence of the excess weight in adults and type 2 diabetes. And also with the social divides. So again, in London, with the higher status, you seem to see individuals that are not likely to be overweight or obese and have type 2 diabetes but you do start to see those patterns within less affluent boroughs and low status locations and equally when we're looking at areas outside of um, London. For the population today as well, it does seem that older males, there tends to be this prevalence of the obesity and type two diabetes to increasing. And again, in um, looking at the figures in modern population, it is this link again to the processed food that uh, individuals are eating. There's a high sugar consumption, probably not as active and, and higher alcohol intake. So a whole plethora, all sort of feeding in literally to one another for um, creating this problem of uh, being overweight. The last area that we were researching was in relation to uh, getting older and uh, today we do all seem to be living to be older but it is seen to be a global phenomena and governments around the world are really rather concerned with an aging population and the impact that has uh, upon them. But what is old age, really? The perceptions of age have probably changed greatly over time. We might see it as loss of teeth or our hair going grey or getting wrinkles, but it can vary enormously from, uh, you know, different individuals in different parts of the world. And also socially, what was the perception of old age? And in the past, when we look, tried to look at that, really the information that was available related more to male and things such as the um, Statute of Westminster from 1285. And that was related, couldn't then be a juror uh, anymore. And the Statute of Labourers of 1349 noted that once you reach the age of 60, there were possibly some tasks that you wouldn't be able to do. So there was a sense of um, a certain age, but some people may not have even known how old they were. So these are all factors that we have to consider and does make it difficult when we're trying to estimate life expectancy um, in the past. So trying to use other means to help us. The um, bills of mortality are, are very interesting records and relate to burial records, but they do then give age um, information. And when we were looking at those from the uh, 1720s to the 1850s, there is an increase in older age individuals, and that increases from 45% in the 1720s up to 53.7% in the 1850s. So clearly there is uh, an improvement. The census records are, are good and are often more accurate, but they can still have uh, limitations. And then we can bring in other uh, documents to help us as well. So there was the Edwin Chadwick report that was looking at the sanitary conditions of labouring population of Great Britain. And what's very notable there again is that difference in terms of where you are in location in London. So in Bethnal Green, it's 16 years of age. And then if you were living in Kensington, your life expectancy then is 26 years. So very noticeable difference then socially. We begin to see a marked increase in improvement really from 1870 onwards. And then again, after World War II and the um, inception of the National Health Service, the life expectancy trajectory has just continued to grow. And uh, in 2014 to 2016, the average age life expectancy for males was 79.2 years and for females was 82.9 years. So there definitely is this trend for us all living to be older. But we then need also to consider that there are different factors that might affect life expectancy, both in our pre-industrial and industrial eras. And we can look at things like famines, we can look at disease profiles, 
public health measures that are brought in to affect um, everyone as a whole. And again, looking at the environment and social conditions, which are really very key. And how then, in terms of London, the London age structure can then be uh, seen at different times to be very different. We try to estimate age in our um, oscillological data set. We do have difficulty um, in the accuracy of them. So there are limitations uh, with these that we then have to bear in mind. We aren't able to give a specific age to an individual into. And because of that, then there do appear to be fewer old age individuals that we might then identify in our oscillological records when comparing to burial records with coffin plates. And they then give us that um, accuracy of the age of death of an individual. And within our study group, we did fortunately have a group of individuals that had that data. So that was really helpful when we were then looking in relation to um, old age and those patterns. But there were significant differences when looking at the age profiles that we were obtaining and comparing when we had our documentary information to those from our skeletons. And it really was very clear when looking at a data source from 1851 to 60 with the mortality data that they really are underrepresented in terms of the, the skeletal assessment compared to the data. And couldn't resist putting in the lovely wax model of Marjorie. So we might perceive that people weren't living to be very old in the past, but here's Marjorie at, at 108. So when we're thinking some of that age, we're also then thinking about diseases. And one of the diseases that will be associated with old age is osteoarthritis, the degeneration of the joint structure. And clinically, it is seen that women have higher rates of it comparatively to men they will often have a more severe form of the disease as well. And there's a difference in the onset of it between males and females. So for men, it's usually before 55, and for women, it's over 50. And this association and link with the menopause and the change in uh, estrogen. When they're looking at patterns um, in terms of diseases, there does seem then to be a, a pattern in that women seem to be more affected with knee osteoarthritis and males in, in the hips. And when we looked at our, our data sets, there was um, an increase in knee osteoarthritis over time in both our London groups and outside of London, but there didn't seem to be any significant difference in the knee osteoarthritis with the females over time. And there wasn't really a significant difference between those of low or high status for male or female or in any of the age groups. The other joint that we looked at was the um, hip, and there seem to be consistently higher rates outside of London for both the pre-industrial and industrial. And with something like this, that might again be in relation to occupation sharing and linking it again to uh, physical activity. But overall, the actual rate for hip OA did increase um, within London. And interestingly, the high status females, they seem to have less hip OA uh, to the lower status. And again, that maybe could be a buffer to possibly um, what type of roles they, they may then have been doing and load bearing. But interesting as well, overall, for the pre industrial. Uh, rural populations, there were always considerably higher rates within the middle age category. And again, we were thinking that could be very much linked to the agricultural lifestyle that they were leading and the working uh, and living environments in, in which they were. Osteoporosis is a disease, again, that probably a lot of people have heard of now. They associate it with uh, individuals who are older. It affects the quality of the bone. Uh, it makes it more fragile. It is much more vulnerable to fracture. You hear about uh, individuals fracturing their wrists or their hips. And when we're looking skeletally for osteoporosis, we will be looking for those sorts of patterns to see which elements then may have been affected. But there are a number of factors, uh, factors that can affect osteoporosis, and it isn't just age. 
So it could be linked to something like malnutrition or maybe a disease such as cancer or treatments that an individual may have um, in modern day. There are clinical methods for them to carry out scanning and screening in relation to osteoporosis. And there we see them in DEXA and radiogrammetry. And the application of radiogrammetry, we were able to do because of doing the digital X-rays and having X-rays of the second metacarpal. So this was absolutely brilliant for us to be able to apply a technique that they would be using clinically to see if we were getting individuals with um, osteoporosis. So our sample uh, was a large sample. We had 1,032 individuals. They covered all the different age ranges um, of males and females from all the different periods. We used the second metacarpal, the bone in the hand, and only used those that were complete that hadn't had any post-mortem damage. And we did measurements and calculations. So we were looking at the metacarpal cortical index. And we followed the two studies that provided scores that we could then use against scores we were reaching to identify if an individual was osteoporotic or had osteoporosis. What was really interesting is that the highest rates um, were coming out with the metacarpal index in our old age adults and particularly so in old age females. Perhaps now maybe today that's not unsurprising and with the females the rates did increase with age. And for Londoners as well, with old age, they had the highest rates within the industrial period and really almost double, 21.8% compared to the non-metropolitan areas at 10.5%. And they are obviously um, affected more by those uh, changes. And we see that throughout industrial and pre-industrial uh, period. What was interesting was that in the period industrial uh, period, we were actually picking up quite high rates of the osteoporosis in younger and middle-aged adults. And that's not something necessarily that we would have expected to find or that you'd expect to find today. And we found those notably in uh, the group that we looked at from St. Mary's Spittle, which is a medieval site. And we know that had been the burials of individuals that had been affected by famine episodes. And you have different burial types and it was those that were in the mass burials that were more affected. And we found in those mass burials that osteoporosis was found much more significantly in the young female adults. And this then we were thinking could be linked to those episodes where you've got climatic change, poor harvests, malnutrition, famines. This actually then is affecting those individuals mothers, babies, this is having quite a profound effect on an individual and therefore you are seemingly prematurely aging and it's because of this result of these intermittent periods of um, malnutrition. And so ultimately now when we look at it, really the process for us physically of growing old really has uh, markedly changed and some of the diseases such as um, osteoporosis or osteoarthritis we might see those now uh, relating to age, but that isn't necessarily always the case when we're looking back into the past. When we were looking at um, old age, from our skeletal data, there did then seem to be that there was an increase over time, but there were other duration. So you have that movement away from the rural to urban centres, this can then affect your demographic profile and that can change in pre-industrial and industrial. And often it's the young moving away to seek work and they will move into uh, cities and that then will affect the communities um, that are then left behind. And this trend of old age individuals we were picking up within that rural community was really present from at least 1851. Uh, and interesting as well, the effect on mortality your status definitely had an effect upon that. And in terms of modern populations as well, your economic prosperity is definitely linked to an increase in your life expectancy and any rates of premature death. And if today you may be living in Kensington or Chelsea, then you can expect to live 10 years longer. So there definitely is that, that interlinking. And there is, as they note um, from statistical data, still this graying, 
as they call it, of the uh, countryside. So when we uh, were writing the book, it was just to say here that osteological study of human remains using the latest imaging technologies repeatedly highlights the importance of the local environment and ultimately the social status that goes hand in hand with it for an individual's health and life expectancy, both in the past and present. So that local environment really is key and your social status. It's all really interlinking into your health and life expectancy. So in conclusion, the industrialization of the city really has been a bit of an assault on the health of Londoners. But what we saw was that it wasn't something that was uniformly happening across all areas and all communities. There were differences. And within London as well, particularly in industrial period, you do see this division according to your age and sex. And in, you can say as well that with the public health measures, that there are both positive and um, negative of age and ageing and age related diseases. They are closely linked to the different lifestyles that you may have, your economic status. And then the numbers that we see affected by diseases we might associate with age today. Again, we're having distinct patterns across the country. But what really is very key is the environment. The environment is important at all levels. It is interlinked to us, to the human body. It's influencing us and also that genetic link. So all of those things are connected and they're shaping us um, both in the past and um, the present and uh, the future. And so lastly, if just to read uh, another quote just from the book, is for the present time, the evidence we have amassed here using digital imaging from largely agrarian rural lifestyles to those based on heavy industry and technology has left a deeply embedded imprint on many aspects of our health in London and the wider UK today. The biological changes we observe in archaeological human remains are a testament to how we are responsible for manufacturing our living environments and our bodies as a result. And so just for me to say thank you very much to everybody who very kindly supported us, all our archaeological colleagues, our osteological colleagues, and of course again to uh, Colat for uh, very generously funding uh, the project. And um, I believe that there is a discount for the book and I know everybody obviously this is the best thing you can buy somebody for Christmas. It'll be on everyone's Christmas wish list. And then lastly, for me to leave the slide there to say that the next lecture is on October the 29th. Elena, thank you very much. That was really fascinating. And um, thank get, you very much. I get the sense that you've given us kind of the, the top level of data and there's an immense richness um, underneath. Um, so we've got some questions coming up in the chat, if you would be happy to address some of those. Um, uh, yes. so, um, Katie Whittaker is asking about whether teeth were incorporated, so dentition, condition of teeth um, into the parts of the study. We, we didn't look at teeth separately. The only um, use where we were looking at teeth was when we looked at our pipe facets for smoking. But uh, teeth are a very important area. And we're aware, again, when we're looking at things like sugar consumption, so caries. But that's another area that we would like to look at with the data set and things like calculus. That's something that we'd be very interested in uh, looking at. But we didn't look at them specifically as an individual element. Yeah, I mean, particularly links with sort of sugar consumption. I, I imagine that yes, will crop exactly. up. Yes. Um, yeah. So Katie's also asking um, whether you're able to make any links between the cemetery populations and specific industries in the areas where they might have been working. Um, well, that's a very good question. Yes, when we we did in our in our analysis, I was saying we were looking at um, types of occupations that individuals may have had. And so we would we'd look at it more generally as if you were possibly then working in the agricultural area or if there was then a mill in that location, but we weren't uh, that 
that specific in that sense. So we, we knew individuals potentially within Fuston, there was the mill. Uh, London, we've got smaller uh, types of outputs for um, different types of occupations or, or roles, but we weren't necessarily able to say these people from this site were particularly then connected to that particular occupation per se. It was more of a, a sort of general overview. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, obviously you focused on adults. Did you deliberately decide to exclude children for a particular reason? And did you pick up any kind of patterning with the, with the um, skeletal populations that you did look at? Yes, well, again, it was a case of what potentially might be available to us, uh, completeness and getting those large numbers and data sets. So we knew that we'd have a greater potential for having adult uh, collections and looking at things like the, the pollution with the cancer, if we were picking up, we would tend to maybe see that more within uh, in adults. Uh, the trauma patterns, it would be then also linking in with the completeness and, and the preservation. So it was that access to data and data sets. So trying to get other collections, London, we're very fortunate, we have large collections, so you have greater chance. But when we began to look outside, that was more difficult with our numbers. And um, so again, trying to get large sample sizes, and particularly for a industrial so our post medieval they were really quite hard to come across the outside of London so yeah it was trying to sort of hone in and and try to bring into the focus so adults was the was the way forward okay thank you very much and um, so I think that's all the um questions that we have we've had so again thank you that was really really interesting um, I give notice that the next meeting will be on the 29th of October 2020 when we will hear a paper Reliquia Suriani the Antiquarian and Contemporary Exploration of Roman Albra by Professor Martin Miller, FSA, and Dr. Rose Ferraby. The meeting stands adjourned.